Hello and welcome to Start USA Training. Today is September 15th, 2020, and we'll be talking about prior disclosures and voluntary self disclosures. We are recording this webinar, uh, and the recording and other materials will be made available after the broadcast. Uh, all participants are going to be muted throughout this, so um, I encourage you to use the, the question and answer feature or the direct chat, uh, and there will be time at the end where we address your questions. Uh, real quick, our uh, company is called Star USA. Uh, we are a trade compliance and consulting uh, advice training services company. We help companies import and export their goods within the regulations and create architectures that help support that, uh, including uh, development of policies and procedures, uh, conducting audits and running disclosures, um, assigning HTS codes, uh, things of that nature. So uh, if you have any interest in those services, please uh, feel free to reach out to us during or after uh, the session today. Um, and we do have another webinar coming up next month on Incoterms 2020 uh, that are in effect today. So if you're interested in that, please uh, follow that link to startusa.org slash training. Uh, I am Michael Easton. I am the President and General Manager of Star USA. Uh, I've spent more than 15 years in the field of import and export compliance, supply chain security, export controls. Uh, my focus is generally on operational excellence, verifiable progress, and sustainable compliance. Uh, but my favorite thing is, is helping uh, make compliance less complicated for people. And that's what uh, these webinars are really for. And with me on the call today is Joe Harper. Joe? Good morning. I'm Joe Harper. I'm a principal for Star USA. I started out kind of entry level working on freight rate comparison and tracking and moved into uh, import audit. I facilitate Star USA's customs broker education course. And I review regulatory integrity for all of our clients. I really like getting nerdy about this stuff and uh, all the stickiness inherent in navigating the regulations combined with everyday business practices. This webinar is going to have a lot of very good and serious information in it and as Michael said, we're going to present it in a slightly casual environment. We might argue with each other about some things. So please hop in with questions at any point via the chat window. I will keep an eye on that. And uh, don't forget that there are CCS and CES points for this. So you can send us your number as well. Okay. And uh... Here we go. Uh, just really before we dive in, Joe, I want to say to the audience, um, we're going to be talking about some uh, potentially some sensitive things. And if you have questions, uh, I would encourage you to frame them in such a way that you're not um, uh, sharing any trade secrets or um, disclosing things to us that you're not intending to. All right, go ahead. We are not lawyers and neither are the rest of the people on the call. So everything we discuss here will be hypothetical. Yes. Uh, we'll hit some of the basics about disclosures, uh, like what they are, when you should disclose, what things you should keep in mind, and how to go about it. Okay. Starting at the very beginning. So a prior disclosure is when a person discloses circumstances of a violation of two specific U.S. codes to a government agent and it is import related and it has to be done before the government is aware, before an investigation is officially begun. And your initial disclosure can be verbal, but if it's verbal, you have to follow it up with a written one. And then you have to follow it up with a perfected disclosure that completely describes all the violations and pays duties. And those two code sections cover entering or introducing merchandise into the commerce of US with information that is incorrect or making false drawback claims. And with uh, self-disclosure and voluntary self-disclosure, what we're talking about here today is mostly the violations of the Export Administration Regulations or the Foreign Trade Regulations. And, and those are both under uh, Title 15 of the Code of Federal Regulations regulations. There are disclosure provisions included in these slides that talk a little bit about uh, violations of ITAR and OFAC, uh, but we're not going to get too deep into the weeds on those. Uh, so if you have questions that are oriented towards that, um, we'll definitely tackle those mostly after this session. 
Uh, and we're talking uh, with the EAR and with the foreign trade regulations, mostly in the, the realm of exports, whereas prior disclosure is in the realm of imports. Uh, similarly, you have to do these disclosures before the, the government becomes aware, but unlike with prior disclosure, a VSD has to be written initially. And that can be a, a catch uh, 22 for a lot of people when they're asking for help from uh, government agents or people that work for the government, uh, but in that asking for information or asking for help, they accidentally disclose an activity that is a violation, that verbal disclosure does not uh, necessarily give you any of the protections of a voluntary self-disclosure. And similarly with the prior disclosure, you do have to follow um, your initial uh, written disclosure with all of the information uh, that describes the violations. Yeah, I find it very interesting that import regs specifically provide for giving a verbal disclosure, but export regs say you can, but only as a very last resort. So always start with written so that they have that to consider. Yeah. So a prior disclosure is made to Customs and Border Protection, specifically an FP&F officer. And it can include partner government agencies, like if you discover you haven't been filing EPA or FDA elements that are necessary, but CBP is going to be the main point of contact. And the really nice thing about prior disclosures is that if CBP determines that it's a valid prior disclosure, that results in penalties being avoided. And we'll go into that more in depth when we look at some of the penalty structure. Yeah, and, and with the voluntary self-disclosure, uh, the agencies that we're primarily concerned with are the Bureau of Census, which is going to be the foreign trade regulations of the FTR, uh, as well as the BIS, or the Bureau of Industry and Security, which is focused on the Export Administration Regulations, or the EAR, or the EAR, as some people call it. Uh, and we're usually dealing with the Office of Export Enforcement, or the OEE. So those are some of the acronyms that you'll see thrown around. The, the DDTC, the Director of Defense Trade Controls, has to deal with ITAR disclosures, and the Office of Foreign Assets Control, OFAC, has to do with um, disclosures surrounding uh, restricted parties and, and uh, things under the Department of Treasury. One of the key differences between a prior disclosure and a voluntary self-disclosure uh, is, is that protection level. And for VSD on the export side, the, the disclosure itself is only a mitigating factor. It does not protect you from penalty. The circumstances of the violation are what, going, are what will determine uh, what sort of uh, penalty action you're looking at or what sort of uh, recourse is going to be taken by the government. And uh, one, of the, one of the keynotes on the CBP side too is uh, you can only avoid penalties uh, if we're in the areas of negligence and gross negligence, but not in the case of fraud. Good. So on the import side for customs, a violation is uh, entry of items by means of false statements or material omission, whether you're negligent, grossly negligent, or actively committing fraud. They can also include conducting customs business without a license or uh, violation of requirements laid on licensed customs brokers. So customs brokers might discover errors that they disclose as well as importers. Yeah, the, the regulations on the violations that apply to customs brokers are much more thorough and contain so many more scenarios that a customs broker might find themselves in. So there is a lot of uh, potential risk for licensed customs brokers and their obligations for uh, acting as a broker. So I find that very interesting how, how detailed those regulations are. So we're looking at census, um, and this is the foreign trade regulations. Uh, most of the provisions uh, for violations have to do with the filing of the EEI. And when we talk about filing on the export side, we're talking about that electronic export information filing, EEI. Uh, and that's all contained within 15 CFR 30. Uh, so you can get a violation for failure to file, for filing late, uh, if you submit false or misleading information. Uh, and pay attention to those words, false or misleading, uh, that, that word false just means wrong, incorrect. Uh, so um, the accuracy of the information is important. Uh, and then additionally, if you have, uh, or if you're found to be furthering any other illegal activities. So that's the kind of the nut for census, but for BIS, it gets a little bit more detailed into what they're talking about. Um, 
if you're engaging in prohibited conduct, if you're causing aiding or abetting, uh, solicitation or attempt to solicit uh, for any unlawful behavior, conspiracy to commit, um, acting with knowledge of a violation. This is a key one that I think uh, people should be more alert to. Uh, it, this puts this bullet point, this provision in the law, puts the onus on the exporter to know what the circumstances of the, of the transaction are. If you know or if you should know, and that should know is as defined by the BIS, if you should know the circumstances of the, of the transaction, do not, that's still your responsibility and you could be found liable. Uh, and the BIS has a lot of language on um, intentional self-blinding uh, and how to recognize the end use or the end user of the goods, uh, as well as whether the goods are gonna be re-exported to a prohibited country. So being aware of that acting with knowledge of a violation, that knowledge word means um, under the BIS's definition of what knowledge is or should be. And possession with intent, misre misrepresentation, evasion, failure to comply, alterations of licenses, that's a big one. Um, you don't get to uh, adjust the license without the approval of the license issuer, whatever agency that might be. And if you act contrary to the terms of the denial order. Denial order, in this context, we're talking about restricted parties um, or um, sanction programs. Uh, so acting against those um, prohibitions of dealing with those persons. So really quickly, Michael, one thing that I find really nice about the export regulations is they tend to be a little more user friendly. I find them easier to parse through at least most of them, especially census and a lot of BIS. Like they really want to make it so that you can follow those rules. Um, and census knows that a lot of the time when you file an EEI, you don't have all the information or bookings move to a later sale date. And so they have provisions in the regulations that say, hey, we understand that things are going to change. When they change, just go back and fix it. Yeah. And that's a part that's really easy to overlook, uh, but is, is important. And if you have a pattern of not doing that, eventually they'll recognize that. Um, and one thing, I don't know if you said this already, but disclosures are on the export side are almost always at least two part because if you do something wrong with one agency like BIS, OFAC, DDTC, you probably reported it wrong to census. So you are going to need to make that correction with the agency that you had the major violation, but then you're also going to need to correct the data with census. That's, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, that cascading, um, result of an error and how errors can, can bloom out of our control um, is, is really something that we need to pay attention to as compliance professionals and ensure that we're acting in concert with the entire uh, regimen of, of, of law. All right, so why should you care, really? Because I know that we all like to do the right thing and that's really important. But there's also specific things that we can point to to show us why we should really pay attention. And these are some of the penalty frameworks under import. And CBP looks at things as to whether or not there's duty loss. So if you brought something in that you imported as duty free, but the HTS was actually one provision that has duty on it, then they lost revenue and they care about that a little bit more. Um, and they also look at it as to whether it's fraud, gross negligence, or negligence. Key to know on all of these things that the maximum penalty cannot exceed the domestic value of the goods. So if there's duty loss and you don't file a prior disclosure, the minimum penalty that they'll assess is five times the total loss of duty for fraudulent items, whereas the maximum is eight times the total loss of duty. If there is a prior disclosure, then like Michael said earlier, you still do have a penalty, but it's just going to be the duty loss amount on top of you paying the duty that you owe and you can't mitigate it down. If there's no duty loss for fraud, you would pay 50% of the value of the goods up to 80% of the value of the goods. But if you make a prior disclosure, you're only paying 10% of that dutyable value. And reading further on, if there's no 
duty loss for a gross negligence or negligent violation that you do a prior disclosure for, there's no penalty. Generally, under a prior disclosure, you pay the duty that was unpaid, and then you also pay interest on the duty as long as CBP accepts that. I find this slide one that's really handy to print out and just have available to reference, especially when we get further on to talking about how you discuss this with management if you find a violation. A lot of the time, your manager wants to know the bottom line, and this is a really great reference to have to calculate that. And then looking at the export side, um, we've got uh, basically two categories of penalty. We've got the civil and the criminal uh, angles of penalty. And you can see that the uh, amounts um, scale up pretty rapidly when you move out of the foreign trade regulations, the FTR. Uh, your max of, of a violation for an FTR uh, is $10,000 for civil uh, error. And as you move into the EAR, ITAR, and OFAC, you're looking at up to half a million dollars or twice the transaction value. So if you have a, a $300,000 shipment, um, it could be, well, it's up to $300,000. Um, but um, when you get into the criminal section, obviously the, the penalties start to escalate. And this is in addition to any other function of law. Uh, it's the, if you're breaking the ITAR rules uh, and conducting a criminal act, you're probably breaking some other laws in the process. Uh, so you're looking at a uh, million dollars uh, per violation for EAR, ITAR, OFAC violations in 10 or 20 years of imprisonment. Uh, so when we're looking at criminal violations in these sectors, um, we would really want to take that very, very seriously. You obviously need to involve uh, legal counsel for um, many of the export violations that are, are uh, branching into the criminal territory. Um, and certainly even in the civil categories for EAR, ITAR, or OFAC, um, there, there could be some major implications there. Um, and just a real quick point on this slide too, uh, the criminal violations um, come into play when there are knowing or willful violations. And that knowledge or uh, willful act uh, is what's going to escalate it from a, a civil penalty uh, into a criminal penalty. Also, these are the amounts that are published in the regulations, and the actual amount is actually adjusted, adjusted for inflation yearly, or so it's higher than this. This is just the amount that's published. And under export, a pretty common penalty is denial of export privileges, and they can also seize your goods and not let you have them back. And we'll, uh, we'll share a, uh, some histories of export uh, violations with you uh, following the webinar. Okay, so for um, mitigated amounts uh, using the, the VSD under the BIS, um, we have the categories of egregious and non-egregious uh, egregious cases. And you can limit the scope of the transaction to about 50%. Um, of what it would be without the VSD. So that's a, that's a pretty substantial um, mitigation factor in there. When we're looking at census, uh, the mitigated factors um, are, are pretty substantial. If we refer back, you can see the $10,000 violations, uh, but you can get that down to, to $750, um, which has increased from years past. But for your first offense, um, for simple errors, late filing and failure to file, if you disclose that, you can limit that whole range of those first offenses uh, to a, a very relatively small amount of money. The more offenses you make, the more times you get to file a disclosure, uh, the more likely that uh, those penalties are going to increase up to the maximums. One fun note on this, um, census doesn't actually impose their own penalties. That right has been delegated to Department of Treasury, which is CBP. So CBP actually sends you a letter if you fail to file your mm -hmm. EEI, and they're the one who instigate that penalty, and they're the ones who you would work with if there's been a penalty assessed already. And there's, uh, for, for mitigation under OFAC and ITAR, uh, a voluntary self-disclosure can often mitigate, and this is not written necessarily into the, into the law, but in practice, uh, we can see that the a voluntary self-disclosure will reduce the amount to 30 to 40% of the maximum value. 
if you have a disclosure in place. And that's for the um, ITAR and OFAC violations, um, bringing that down to uh, literally less than half of what the maximum could be. And one other thing they do on the export side fairly commonly is if a company they impose this huge penalty and there's no way a company can pay it. So they will say, all right, pay a quarter of it and we're gonna hold this other three quarters over your head for the next five years and watch you like a hawk. And if you do everything perfectly fine, you don't have to pay it. But if you mess up again, you'll have to pay that. Yeah, that happened recently with a foreign firm. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about a when to disclose um, and, and what that process looks like. So for final Sorry. questions. Uh, yeah. I was unmuting. <laughs> on, the, on the import side, you can do several solutions without having to do a prior disclosure. And I, I'm gonna say that, but I'm gonna also say, we're gonna talk later about patterns. So you wouldn't want to correct a huge amount of things, say every entry you've made or even two thirds of your entries without at least considering a prior disclosure. And we'll talk more about that coming up. But from the time of import, you have about 10 days to file and finalize that entry. So your broker can update that entry without it actually being a post summary correction for a short period of time. And then from 10 days after that, from when your entry was filed, all the way up to 20 days before that entry liquidates, you can file a post summary correction for most things. There's some things like uh, USMCA or NAFTA that you file a different type of correction. And then anytime the entry liquidates up to 180 days after liquidation, you can file a protest. And with export, um, your time windows for uh, filing your corrections or making a correction uh, tend to be uh, tied to the export information filing um, where if you get a, a fatal error message, uh, you have to correct that prior to departure. Fatal messages are an indication that the filing was not accepted and the shipment is not cleared at export. So you have to resolve that um, before the goods actually uh, get onto, uh, get laid down the vessel. For a warning or a verify message through the AES system, you typically have four days to um, resolve that issue before they consider it final. Um, the verify messages that you get in there, those warning messages, uh, they can appear for all kinds of reasons, uh, like an unusual weight or a dollar amount that doesn't seem to reflect that Schedule B number. Uh, so it's like a systemic um, thing within the, within the automated export system that kind of surfaces, hey, this looks unusual, check it out. In many cases, I'd say about half the cases, no correction is necessary. It just requires that diligence to look. And the other half, you might have uh, made a typo. And this warning message will actually help you correct that typo before you put in incorrect information. Uh, and anytime you have to, uh, you find an error and you need to make a change or a correction or cancellation for, for basically any export violation, the provision is as soon as possible, as soon as you become aware. So you wanna make sure that you're acting uh, rapidly if you discover an error. And for disclosures in general, uh, the re recommendation is if you're going to make a disclosure, you should uh, look backwards uh, a full five years for either export or import. Why is that, Michael? Because that is the statute of limitations. Yeah. So if you go and you tell a government agency, hey, we looked at our stuff. This is the only problem we found. Here you go. They might think, really, that's the only problem you found and dig in a little deeper. And then if they find any errors that in that five year period that were not disclosed in your prior disclosure or your voluntary self disclosure, then they can assess normal penalties and it's not, it doesn't have that same privilege or mitigating factor. Okay, patterns. Um, so when considering whether, whether or not to make a uh, disclosure, whether it's a prior disclosure or voluntary self-disclosure, you wanna ask yourself a, a series of questions to kind of identify how, how deep the rabbit hole goes. Um, one of the first things I always like to ask is, how was the error discovered? Did it come up through internal review where you were doing it as, as part of your normal course of business and or part of your normal audit process? 
uh, where you review an entry or you review an export filing or just activity in general and you found the error? Or did a vendor or customer tell you and it's now outside of your organization? Uh, did your broker ask you a question? Your freight forwarder raise a red flag for you? Uh, did an outside auditor discover this? Or in the worst case scenario, were you notified by a federal officer either through an FPNF notice or a CBP 28 uh, request for information, or even just through conversation where uh, an agent asked you a question about one of your practices and it led you down a rabbit hole. Those circumstances will dictate how important it is to make a disclosure or to just make a correction in, in some of those um, cases. Another factor is when did this first occur? Uh, and how long has it been happening? How many times did it occur? If it's, uh, as Joe was mentioning earlier, if it's a one-off mistake, um, many times um, the correction is the best path forward to go and doing a disclosure and only disclosing one mistake um, is kind of a red flag, uh, depending on the circumstances, obviously. In some cases that might be it, it's just one mistake. But in most cases for disclosure, you're looking at, um, over, occurring over a longer period of time. And you need to be make sure, making sure that you're evaluating all of those factors. Um, was it a human error or was it a systemic error? Uh, human error basically meaning things like a typo or a, a clerical error um, on, a, on a document or something to that effect. Or is it embedded into your system and every single entry or every single export that you've had over the last three, four, five years has this same problem? Um, so that those, those things drive me towards, uh, obviously the, the more frequent the occurrence, the more systemic it is, uh, moving towards a disclosure versus uh, trying to handle it uh, through correction or uh, other means. And lastly, have you exercised your reasonable care or your due diligence uh, on ensuring that this error could, would not occur in the first place? Did you have an opportunity to correct it earlier and you missed it? Uh, how, did it how did it actually manifest? And those are, those are uncomfortable questions, but those are the questions that customs and BIS and census are going to be thinking about. So you have to, you have to have them. It's, it's like George Washington and the cherry tree. They're going to look at you a little more politely if you say, actually, yeah, I, I did cut that down. Um, and a lot of the time, uh, agent inquiry, you can look at it and you can say, okay, hey, you sent us a CVP 28 on this one entry. And when we were reviewing that, we noticed this hinky thing. And we went back and we assessed all of our other entries. And we figured out that same thing happened on all of these other ones. And we're addressing it. And we would like to work with you on that. And for the most part, government agents are people too. And they're motivated for you to be motivated to comply. And it's much more, companies are much more likely to engage and comply when them finding errors and disclosing it is met with kind of a partnership towards resolution instead of uh, a whole bunch of hand slapping. So generally they will allow you to disclose even if they've issued a CVP 28. Mm -hmm. And another factor on the, on the 28s are those, those inquiries that they make. Uh, they're generally aimed at one specific instance. And if that leads you to find that that same instance has occurred many, many times, um, even if that one instance may not be protected by a disclosure, you would still try, but you can make sure that the rest of those instances of those occurrences get covered under the disclosure and that protection, that mitigation factor. Now, don't take that, my statement of usually they want to work with you as to, as motivation to call up your contact and tell them everything. Do not do that. Absolutely don't do that. You would still want to work with somebody and kind of get some advice and insight. But for the most part, they're people too, and they are motivated towards uh, collaboration. Mm -hmm. These things are all priority trade issues. Uh, and if you find a violation that's 
dealing with those that has happened more than once, it's definitely something that you would lean towards filing a disclosure of some sort. Anything that pertains to agriculture and quota, anti-dumping and countervailing duties, the safety and protection of imports and your supply chain, any intellectual property rights like uh, trademarks and copyrights, revenue. So that's the one where did they get all their duty? Was your HTS classification right, etc. cetera. Uh, textiles, always a hot one, and then trade agreements. And it, it specifically provides for doing prior disclosures around trade agreements and lists out all the different ones, which is interesting to me. Yeah, one of the key things too with the revenue factor there uh, are things like section 301 duties uh, and the imposition of additional or supplemental uh, charges. Uh, so that those definitely factor into uh, the priority trade issues. And import safety as well. Um, I think human trafficking is one of the, the major um, uh, issues that they're concerned with uh, these days. So recognizing if your supply chain is um, involved in human trafficking in any way whatsoever, uh, you definitely want to get that uh, surfaced and notify the uh, officials right away. And then on the export side, uh, there are some elevated risk factors that you need to pay attention to, uh, particularly if your goods are licensable, uh, if you have a high value merchandise item, uh, if you're dealing with restricted or denied parties, particularly if um, you discover it uh, after you've made an export, uh, you definitely want to make a disclosure there. Uh, whether or not they were on the list before or they got added to the list after you made the export, you still want to disclose, uh, hey, this party was uh, not on the list when we exported, but you know, three months later, we find out that they are on the list and we made this shipment three months ago. Uh, you want to have that disclosure, even though you did nothing wrong, you want to make sure that you're surfacing this to um, the administration. And then any systemic errors are usually cause for um, creating a voluntary self-disclosure. <clears throat> so prior disclosures, the, the clock starts when you figure out that there's been a violation. And we'll dig a little bit more into that, what that violation discovered means. But then you, you can either do an oral disclosure or you can write them a short letter that just says, hey, for this period of time or for these specific entries made it in these locations, we've found some errors that pertain to these areas. We're going to get you all of the correct information as soon as we can. And technically the regs say you have 30 days to do that. And you wanna be kind of vague in your original one. You're not gonna say, our employee Jeff just liked to throw darts at the HTS and he had a lot of fun picking random things. Oh, Jeff. Uh, but you, you would say, hey, we, we're reviewing, we take this seriously, we're gonna get you full details. And then again, you have 30 days to get that, but Customs offers extensions because they understand that a lot of the time getting full information together is very time intensive. If you're dealing with multiple vendors and you're reviewing all of your classifications, if you have to go to another government agency like the International Trade Administration to get an anti-dumping scope ruling, that takes longer. So they generally will provide those for you. Yeah. And with the voluntary self-disclosure process, again, the clock starts at the same time uh, when you become aware of the violation and your obligation on the export side is to make a notification as soon as possible. The law provides you up to 180 days uh, to provide that full narrative, but that could be um, altered by other factors related to the actual circumstances of the violation and, and its severity uh, and, and you know what's at stake. Uh, so you, want to provide um, census and BIS um, with a time frame on when you're going to complete the, the voluntary self-disclosure and they'll provide you a confirmation of that. <clears throat> but you need to get that um, kind of established at the outset so that you know what sort of clock you're working with. Um, you can get extensions um, depending on the circumstances of the transaction uh, and if you have cause uh, for that extension. I want to say I'm seeing questions come in and I'm loving all of the anonymous questions. Keep it up. You guys are great. And we'll, we'll get to those for sure at the end. I've seen them as well. 
All right, we're going to talk about some of the considerations and factors that affect uh, the, the disclosures. So these are mitigating factors. These are the good ones that you want to have on your side. You, uh, customs it will take it into account if they did something that contributed to the error. Like if uh, somebody issued a CF-29 that said you have to classify everything this way and then two years later you realize through maybe a customs ruling or some other thing that that was wrong, that's a contributory customs error. Then they count extraordinary cooperation with the investigation. So just saying, yep, we're working with you doesn't count. They, they take into account things like you funding, uh, getting them a computer that they can work on, not a bribe, but going out of your way and inconveniencing yourself either by time or finances to assist with their investigation. They also look at whether or not you are prepared to immediately pay and you also reviewed your whole chain and said, hey, this is how this error happens and we're putting in this control so that it won't be repeated. If you're a new importer or relatively inexperienced or you, you import once every six years, they'll take that into account as well. They will also listen if you have previously had a really good record and you generally don't cause problems. If you absolutely can't pay the customs penalty, if you're a tiny business, they will work with you and they'll mitigate things down. And they will also grant some relief in cases that are not fraudulent. If customs knew about the violation and they could have gotten in there and had some corrective action, but they just didn't for whatever reason. And on the export side, similar to on the import side, uh, these things working in your, in your favor, um, one of the key things is an immediate remedial response. Uh, if you stopped that violating conduct immediately uh, and you filed your voluntary self-disclosure, um, if you fully vetted and uncovered the causes, you informed management, put brought in better controls and you've conducted a thorough review and you can evidence that through your disclosure process, uh, those are all gonna count in your favor towards uh, demonstrating your cooperation, demonstrating your commitment to um, maintaining and upholding the, the regulations. And again, extraordinary cooperation with the Office of Export Enforcement, um, particularly getting all information in a timely manner. One of the, the key things with export is, um, unlike with imports where the goods are in the U.S. in most cases, exports, they've left the country. So the, the sooner you can take action and provide them with exactly what happened, what the circumstances are, uh, the better equipped they'll be to be able to mitigate the downstream impacts. So if you accidentally exported a biological weapon, I'm using accident in air quotes here, um, but it's still on the ship or on the vessel, uh, the agents uh, can often uh, get control of that uh, cargo before it gets into the hands of the wrong uh, parties. Um, so versus, you know, six months on the road uh, and it's, God knows where that, uh, where that cargo went. So that, those are, those are important factors to consider. Uh, if a license was likely to be approved, uh, but the export happened um, through, you know, extraordinary circumstances uh, and the, there wouldn't have been a violation if it had been a couple of days later. Um, those things will play into, in the, into fact and again first time violations uh, similarly um, if you have a if you have a positive track record with uh, with the agencies on your export side <clears throat> and this is the first time making error uh, those are going to be mitigating factors in your defense so here's some aggravating factors these are things that weigh against you or can offset the mitigating factors None of these aggravating factors will increase your level of culpability. That's just set where it is, but they can make it so that the good things on your side don't count. These are all, all of these aggravating and mitigating factors for import are in the regs and some appendices. So don't obstruct an investigation or an audit. Don't withhold evidence. Don't give them misleading information. This is just tell them straight up you cut down the tree. They will also count if 
you have done this, your company has had these violations multiple times over multiple years and previously those have been resolved, you clearly didn't learn your lesson the first time. Textile imports that have illegally transshipped, that's a big deal. Textiles are hot. Uh, any evidence that you were evading a restriction on getting merchandise brought in, so if you're trying to work around a quota or prohibited goods or that kind of thing, not a good factor. And if you do not comply with their request for records or their summons. Yeah, and on the export side, I just about all those same import things apply. Um, and with the export side, there are some additional um, considerations to be aware of. Uh, things like management involvement um, is one of those circumstances where they can actually pierce the, the corporate veil and uh, hold the actual owners or, or, or shareholders of the company responsible if management was involved in that violation, particularly if it was willful or reckless. Uh, and, you know, trying to conceal, uh, having a pattern of conduct are, are problems. Um, another factor that people overlook is the, the prior notice. Uh, if, particularly if a federal agent has um, informed you that there could be a cause for concern here and you took no action, uh, there, are, there are many um, branches of the government that do help companies export, but they are federal agents that are the ones they're helping with that. And you want to make sure that you listen to what they're saying. If they say, uh, hey, something seems hinky about this export here or this, this buyer, um, that's, that's notice. If you do nothing with that information, uh, you, you could be found at um, additional culpability. Uh, whether or not it'll reach the threshold of willful or reckless is a you know, matter of review. Uh, and if you had the reason to know, uh, and this is another one that trips people up a lot, uh, you have an expectation to know these, the factors of your, of your shipments and how it's going to be used, who's going to be using it, whether it's going to be transshipped. Uh, you have an expectation. So that means that you had reason to know that this was going to happen. So if, uh, for example, if your goods are being um, sold to Germany and then transshipped to Iran uh, that in violation of a denial order, uh, but you were selling to a distributor in Germany and you just never bothered to ask the question or make them aware of the export issues, uh, that could be a violation of that reason to know uh, standard. And again, if it has any implications for national security, U.S. national security, U.S. foreign policy. We've seen on both the import and export side several times where uh, a company that we work with has an agent that they're speaking to and the agent says like, okay, something's up here. I won't be back at my office until two days from now, so I won't start any paperwork. If you guys disclose this in that time frame, we'll be able to accept that as a disclosure. So definitely listen if any agent anywhere has said, this looks weird, what are you doing with that, et cetera. Then there's some other things that aren't necessarily mitigating or aggravating, but that government agents are going to look at. And that is, are there related violations or multiple unrelated violations? How big and sophisticated is your company? If you're a tiny one person business that's exporting and you have no clue of the regulations and there's really not any way that you could do all of those jobs, they're going to take that into, an, into account. Versus if you're a large corporation that supposedly has a compliance program and all of that set up. They'll also take into account how many and how valuable those transactions were. And if you have good regulatory reputations with other rep agencies, if this was illegal, and or you have criminal convictions in your past, whether or not you have a compliance program and whether them complying with you and collaborating with you is going to lead towards you continuing to comply and deter you from violating or whether you're going to just take that as I can do whatever I want and I'll get away with it. 
Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about the actual act of making disclosure in terms of what the framework looks like. <clears throat> so, if you if you suspect that there's a violation, the very first thing you want to do is confirm it. You want to dig in and be sure. Uh, it is better not to start a disclosure and then say actually there's nothing because that makes agencies a little bit suspicious. Then immediately stop doing whatever that violation is. If you can continue importing and exporting without making the violation, great, go ahead. But if, act, if the act of importing or exporting is the violation, then you need to stop that as well until you get a better framework in place. Then you wanna notify the agency. Oh, sorry. Then you wanna notify internally and get buy-in from management and legal or external counsel. Then you want to disclose. Then you'll move on to implementing all of your corrective actions and they should be permanent plans. They shouldn't be stopgap measures. Then you're going to prepare your perfected disclosure that meets all of the requirements, that addresses all of the questions that the agency will have. Then they will process it and you will need to accept whatever their conclusion is. On the customs side, generally they say, hey, you need to pay us this amount of money and you pay it within 30 days. Uh, on the export side, I think it's similar. Yeah. And then go forth and send no more. You need to maintain your diligence, keep your procedures active and reviewed and updated as well as as you go along. So notifying management is one of the most challenging aspects of uh, dealing with prior disclosure or any sort of violation or error that's occurred. Um, I, I've been in this, uh, these shoes several times. I've worked with people that have been in these positions. Um, and these are basically the four points that I think provide the best uh, opportunity for success and getting the, the right outcome uh, that you and your company need. Number one is make sure you have facts. Uh, have solid data, clearly identify the confirmed errors. Remember, you're not going to management before you've confirmed the error. Uh, you want to avoid things like speculation or supposition or guessing. Uh, and if you need to uh, include some what-if scenarios, then put those into an additional consideration section of your, of your findings. Uh, number two, you want to be clear. Uh, be concise, prepare your details in a manner that can be understood by a layperson whether that's somebody in your management uh, who doesn't have any understanding or at least not firsthand understanding of um, import and export uh, regulations or trade issues, whether it's for your legal counsel who's uh, likely going to be more oriented towards business law, not import export trade law, or in some cases, the federal agents. Uh, you wanna make it super simple for them to understand and under, uh, see exactly what has transpired. Um, for your management team, you want to know what the impact is going to be. So you should conduct what, what we call an impact assessment. Um, what are the results of the change process? What are the results of the violation itself? Uh, what are the short, short and long-term direct impacts? Spell that out as clearly as you can perceive them uh, to make it simple for uh, a supervisor or somebody to see the team of events from where we are today to getting to the end of the, of the um, disclosure process. Uh, in, in that same vein, you want to have that plan identify all of those steps that need to happen, what to do next, uh, the options for the path forward. If it's at all unclear, you can create you know, different scenarios, uh, but otherwise you wanna lay that path out from today to this is all behind us. And one thing to not forget that I also consider is the impact and liability for your outside parties, whether they're your customers and suppliers, your brokers and forwarders, or there's other departments within your organization or the key stakeholders of this process. You wanna make sure that you've considered what the, the downstream impacts are gonna be as well. Uh, in my experience, uh, sorry, Joe. Um, nope, go. Okay. Um, in my experience, management is interested in two things, getting through this problem and never being in this situation again. Uh, those are their two top priorities. That said, all management is different, all situations are different, so you wanna um, kind of weigh uh, their different types. Also, one thing is document that you notified them, but kind of carefully. Uh, and especially on the export side, let your management know that now that they know about this, they have actual personal liability on this. 
So by telling them about the problem, they're now part of that management involvement as an aggravating factor. And there are many cases where there were individual penalties assessed against management who would not allow situations to be disclosed or resolved. Yeah. And then when you progress to filing the actual disclosure, uh, you want to make sure that you start by establishing your legal baseline. Uh, look at the regulation, look at the, uh, the framework for submitting the disclosure, make sure you're adhering to all of the provisions and protections under the law, and you follow those prescribed formats completely. If something doesn't apply to your case, but it's listed in the you know, steps to pay attention to, indicate that this does not uh, apply. So address it, uh, for example, if it's for licensable shipments. Um, indicate that there are no licensable goods on this shipment so that you're at least um, not missing one of the factors. You wanna be complete in that. Uh, your detail uh, should be um, assembled and representative of the impacted transactions, full supporting documents, full summaries, uh, and you wanna be clear and open um, or during your disclosure. And you should generally, in my experience, provide abundant information in that disclosure process. You, you never wanna be found lacking uh, during a disclosure. You've already told them you've done something wrong or made a mistake. Uh, so you want to make sure that they have all the information necessary to confirm uh, the scope of the mistake that you made and that you've taken the proper precautions against it. Uh, your corrections that you make and that you implement need to be clearly illustrated. Uh, and this is why we uh, have the um, implement correction step prior to the finalized or the perfected uh, disclosure um, submission. Uh, because you want them in place and you want them working uh, before you go to the government and say, we've taken these steps. You don't want to say, we will take these steps. You want to say, we did take these steps in the wake of this. And then finally, for your submission, make sure you've got an expert involved prior to going to the government. Uh, and make sure that you've got um, uh, clear advice and guidance, whether it's from uh, legal counsel or, or from experts like us, um, where they've looked at the whole picture, the whole scenario, and they have determined that this is the um, sufficient for the cases at hand. And once you initiate that disclosure process, you really need to perfect your information as rapidly as possible because you want to be ahead of the government at every step. One of the key factors is having a compliance management program and a manual and processes. So the government knows that mistakes are going to happen and if somebody says, nope, we never make any mistakes, nothing ever goes wrong, then they're going to get suspicious. So having that conversation open where you are periodically letting them know, hey, we found this error, we fixed it, here's all the things that we did, which is what Michael was talking about on that last slide, is helpful. And your best way to be able to catch those mistakes and prevent them from recurring in the same way is having a compliance program and having a manual that's actually used. So customs doesn't wanna come in and say, where's your manual and have somebody go dig through a filing cabinet in the basement and pull out a dusty thing that's 20 years old. They want to see processes that are on the desks of the people who are doing those things. So your purchasing has one bit that's relevant to them and your sales has another section that's relevant to them and shipping has a section that's relevant to them that's being used and being updated as you go. And that is a great way to show that you are training your staff if they sign off when they get the manual and they review it and you're periodically going and checking that things are aligned and a good control and audit. Those are both things that all the government agencies want to see. They want to see that you're periodically auditing and they want to see that you have elements in place that will act as flags to stop those violations from recurring. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to call a quick audible here. We're about five minutes from the end of the webinar. Um, so we'll come back to the questions and answers in just a second since there's a, a pretty long list in here. Um, and we'll, we'll pause the recording um, and to, to tackle those. Um, so uh, just getting towards the end of the webinar. Um,
We have some tools and resources that we will provide. Uh, we will provide the slides, we will provide the recording, it will be published. Uh, it'll take about, about a day to get out there. And we'll also make sure that these other resources are available to you. Uh, the ABCs of prior disclosure, mitigation policies, um, VSD instructions, uh, the export compliance program that, that Joe was just talking about, um, the BIS has an export compliance program manual uh, or starter guide uh, published. Uh, we'll make sure you have that. And then some of the regu regulatory citations that we want you to have. So before we circle back to questions and answers, I want to say thank you uh, for myself, um, for, for everyone attending here. Uh, if you have CCS or CES credit requests, make sure they go to train at staruc.org. Those of you that post them in the uh, Q&A section here, uh, we'll make sure that those get in as well. Um, so thank you all for your time. And I'm going to stop the recording now. All right, I'll read you a question. <clears throat> 